So let me introduce Jim Rickards. Jim is an American lawyer, an economist, and is a regular commentator on finance. As general counsel for the hedge fund Long-Term Capital Management, LTCM, Jim worked on Wall Street for over 35 years. He was the senior managing director for market intelligence at Omnis Inc. consulting firm. Jim is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Currency Wars, published in 2011, The Death of Money, published 2014, The New Case for Gold, published 2016, and The Road to Ruin, again, published 2016. He is the editor of the newsletter Strategic Intelligence and a member of the advisory board of the Physical Gold Fund. He is an advisor on international economics and financial threats to the Department of Defense and, is, and the US intelligence community. Jim also served as a facilitator of the best ever, uh, the first ever, my apologies, financial war games conducted by the Pentagon. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Mr. Jim Rickards. Daryl, thank you for that uh, introduction. It is uh, a pleasure to be here in Adelaide today. I, uh, there was a, a bit of a reception last night, and I made a few remarks, and I s described what a beautiful city it was based on having driven around. I came into the airport, ran around to uh, some of the suburbs, went over to uh, West Lakes, and got a little bit of a view of things. And uh, it was clearly a very, uh, very nice uh, city. But this, this morning, uh, in the beautiful weather you've all experienced getting here, I had a little time to go out and walk around uh, your river walk and the uh, Torrens River, and I was just blown away. The, the architecture, the, uh, the people, um, the, the river itself, the views, it's an absolutely gorgeous city. I'm uh, so glad I've, I can add it to the list of uh, places in Australia I've been. I've been coming to Australia since 1982, uh, on and off for 35 years, been able to uh, get to Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne and um, Cairn and uh, Port Douglas and a few other places, even been to Alice and a little road drove about 700 miles in the outback. So I feel like uh, Australia is almost a second home, but getting to Adelaide sort of checks off another um, important stop on the, uh, on the list and very, very happy to be here. And thank you all uh, for coming here. Um, we're, um, I think we're in for a, a treat today, which is uh, I'm giving a presentation I never do the same presentation twice. When I say that, what I mean is, you know, some of the slides we, uh, we update, but they're always new slides. I take the old slides and add new points, so we always try to keep it very, very fresh. Um, but I don't, um, I don't use a teleprompter or, or even an outline at this point. I'll just sort of speak ex extemporaneously, but I know the material fairly well. But uh, the difference is that, um, depending on the event sponsor, we'll have a presentation like the one uh, we're doing today. And they'll say, well, you have a half hour, you have 45 minutes, or you have an hour, but we're gonna do 40 minutes and 20 minutes of questions, as the case may be. And you make it work, uh, but some of these slides are uh, actually call for a little more in-depth uh, explanation. But um, thanks to uh, Daryl and, um, and the As Good As Gold team, I've been given uh, an hour and a half to do this, which, uh, uh, so make yourselves comfortable. But the, the, the good news is we're gonna be able to drill down on every one of these concepts. We're gonna be able to really, I think, you know, explain this, uh, how the monetary system works, how gold plays into it, how it connects with geopolitics, how the, all these things tie together, how there are events coming up sooner than later that will impact you, impact your investments, impact gold. We're gonna talk about all that, and uh, I'm kind of uh, thriving on the, the luxury, if you will, of being able to do this on uh, a slightly more extended uh, format, in a, in a more extended format. The other thing is uh, we're gonna do this presentation uh, take a little coffee break, and then I'm going to come back up for questions. So normally, sometimes we do it, and we, we have questions at the end while I'm at the podium. I love the questions. I get a lot out of it. I know that um, uh, most people say, well, you have only got a chance to ask one question. So by definition, they're going to ask me or any speaker the most important thing on their mind. And that's very valuable to me because I learn a lot about what is on people's minds and what they're concerned about. And uh, as I say, I, I love the interaction. I love meeting people. So we're going to do a long Q&A, but we're going to do it after the coffee breaks. So for now, uh, 
Um, you know, they say fasten your seat belts. I'm going to be up here talking for a while. I have done this for as long as five hours, by the way. I was invited to uh, Kuala Lumpur by the former Prime Minister, uh, Mohammed Mahathir. Uh, he was Prime Minister for, I think, 22, 23 years from the, uh, about the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. And he put together a group of his closest associates, uh, uh, really the, the former central bankers, former cabinet ministers, uh, the, the leaders of uh, the Malaysian economy um, in, in tin, uh, palm oil, um, uh, uh, various minerals, um, tourism, real estate, uh, et cetera. And uh, so we did about five hours. We did, we did three hours, then we, they took two hours for mosque, and then we came back for two hours at the end. I didn't go to the mosque. I went to my room and took a nap and came back, but I was, I was uh, on my feet for five hours and uh, was able to get through it, so I think we can do an hour and a half today. Anyway, very much uh, uh, looking forward to this. So with that, by, uh, by way of introduction, let's just uh, jump in. I call this gold the once and future money. Um, that suggests two different time periods. Gold has certainly been money throughout the entire history of civilization. Uh, you all know that. 5,000-year uh, track record. That's longer than any currency, longer than any stock, bond, uh, or any other uh, commodity you can think of where it serves as money. And I say future money because I do see a world where gold will be uh, money again in, in, the, in, the, in a primary role, really, as a kind of a part of a gold standard. And there are many, many ways to construct a gold standard. We'll talk about that a little bit. But I don't mean to suggest that gold is not money today. Uh, in, in fact, it is money today. I ask, uh, have occasion to talk to um, central bankers, members of the Board of Governors or Federal Reserve System, people from the IMF, uh, people from other central banks around the world. And of course, they would all have you believe that gold is not money and they disparage gold and they, they don't have a kind word to say about gold uh, or they, they blow it off if someone asks them a direct question. Uh, and then I say, well, that's interesting. Why does the IMF have over 1,000 tons of gold? Why does the United States have over 8,000 tons of gold? Why have Russia and China tripled their gold reserves in the last 10 years? Why does the European Central Bank and all the members of the Eurozone, not the EU, but the Eurozone, the, the 19 countries that make up the Euro, why do they have 10,000 tons of gold, more than the United States, if it's not money? Well, the answer is, of course it's money. They just don't want you to think it's money. They don't want you to focus on that because they want you to look at the other kind of money that they print and control uh, and you know, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, as they say in The Wizard of Oz. So, of course, gold is money. The elites know it. Um, you know it. Um, they don't want to talk about it, but we do, and we will. So uh, that's, the, um, that's, that's where we uh, get the title. And, of course, a couple uh, uh, gold coins from the, um, from the Roman Empire, late antiquity, and it was precisely when... Uh, Rome devalued the, the, the gold. They started, they started chipping little pieces off of it so you didn't get quite as much gold as you thought, and then they changed the composition, they diluted it all. That's debasement, really putting base metals in with gold, and uh, their empire fell along with it. No, no, no empire, no leading uh, economic power, no leading political power has ever prevailed for long without a sound currency, and gold is the most sound currency of all. So uh, there's, a, as I say, there's a geopolitical tie into all this, and we'll, we'll make that point. So let's uh, jump ahead. Let, let's start with a basic question. Talking about gold as money, talking about fiat currencies, et cetera, what is money? Uh, everybody thinks they know what money is. Oh, I got some money, I made some money, I invested some money in the stock market, I did this or that with money. But what is money? Um, well, here we have some examples of money. Uh, at various times, uh, feathers, shells have been money. Uh, uh, beads can be money. The other ones look a little more familiar. Gold, the euro, you know, Bitcoin, silver. Uh, we have digital forms of money, credit cards, debit cards, and um, cryptocurrencies. Every one of these um, is or has been a form of money at one time or another. Um, I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin. I don't own any. I don't recommend it. But it's money. I, I'm not going to dispute that uh, for those who transact in it. So all these forms of money, uh, all of these are forms of money, and they meet the three basic parts of the definition, uh, a store of value. Uh, you can translate something else into it, and it holds the value, and you can get it out. Uh, medium of exchange, you can use it to transact, buy things or sell things, et cetera. And a unit of account, a way of keeping score or determining how much money you have, or whether it's uh, government accounts, balance of payments, et cetera. Um, but what do these forms of money have in common? We've got physical, we've got precious metals, we've got digital, we've got crypto. Uh, what is it that, um, 
that makes the money? And the answer is one word. That word is confidence. Confidence is very fragile. If you are confident, if I'm offering you some form of money, and it could be dollars or gold or Bitcoin, if you're confident that, um, that it's money, that you can turn around and give it to someone else, and they'll be confident as well, and that person likewise. If, if all of the people interacting are confident that something is money, it's money. The problem is, this is a psychological concept. Confidence is fragile. It can be very easily lost. Once it's lost, it's almost impossible to regain. And this is really what you have to ask yourself about money. So the point is, almost, almost anything can be money. Uh, when we're feathers money, well, among certain, uh, I don't know about the globally, but certainly in the United States, I'm familiar, certain indigenous peoples, certain uh, Native American tribes, uh, use feathers as money. Well, it just meant in their community or their tribe, um, someone who took the feathers was very confident that they could give it to someone else in exchange for goods and services. And obviously, over time, that confidence was lost, as it uh, uh, has been or will be lost in, uh, in most of these, although it's never been lost in, uh, in gold and silver. But the point is, uh, confidence is the key. But So this is the common denominator of money. And without it, something is not money. So if you're, if you're looking at gold or silver or Australian dollars or US dollars or Bitcoin or anything else, ask yourself one thing. Don't look at the price, don't look at the cross exchange rate, don't look at the hype, ask yourself, how confident am I that this is money today? And how confident am I that this will be money in the future? And if the answer is uh, yes and yes, uh, I am confident and I'm confident it'll be in the future, then it's probably a good form of money. If you have some doubt about those questions, you might wanna, might wanna think twice. So let's talk about gold as money, now that we've, we have a notion of what money is. Um, what about gold as money? Well, the, the elites, and you know, when I use the word elites, uh, I'm not talking about some deep, dark conspiracy, uh, you know, the Illuminati, uh, people with, sitting around an oak table with hoods on their heads, et cetera. I'm talking about people we know. Uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, managing director of the IMF. Uh, Janet Yellen, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. Mario Draghi, chairman of the European Central Bank. Um, you know, the heads of the central bank in Australia, someone like Mark Carney, uh, governor of the Bank of England, but also uh, chairman of the Bank for International Settlements, uh, professors, people like Larry Summers um, and others. Uh, it, it's, it's a well-known group of individuals. It's not a large group, probably several hundred at the core and maybe a few thousand beyond that. Uh, but these are the global monetary elites. They tell you to a person, talk to any one of them, and I have spoken to a number of them, that gold is not money and you cannot have a gold standard. Uh, and you say, why? Why not? And they give you some objections. And here they are. They say, well, don't you know that there's, there's not enough gold to support finance and commerce? We'd love to have a gold standard, but you know, the way the global economy is growing and 60 trillion of wealth and hundreds of trillions of payments and transactions, et cetera, there's just not enough gold to support all that. We need paper money that we can, you know, what they, they actually, uh, um, have a word for it, they call it elastic. We need an elastic money supply to support a growing economy. And gold has some good features, but it, there's not enough of it, okay? Second objection, uh, the gold supply does not grow fast enough to support the growth. And so even if you had enough to start with, it doesn't keep up. You know, world growth uh, you know, grows faster than the gold supply, and so uh, it, it can't do the job. It's not, again, they use the word elastic, but you, know, you do need to, if you're expanding the economy, you do need to expand the money supply to maintain price stability, uh, and that's true. And they're saying, well, the problem with gold, it can't keep up. It doesn't expand fast enough. The third one, this is a favorite of Warren Buffett, gold has no yield. You know, eh, I like gold, but it doesn't pay me any dividends. There's no interest. There's no, uh, I don't get anything out of it. If I buy stocks, I get a dividend. If I buy bonds, I get interest, you know, et cetera. And gold just has no yield. And how are you going to get rich if there's no yield? You know, you get yield and compounds and compounds and... You, know, you play the tax games, and this is why Warren Buffett's worth, uh, you know, $80 billion, et cetera. So that's an objection. The other one you hear a lot from uh, people like Paul Krugman and others is, uh, you know, the, the, um, the monetary economists. Uh, well, gold caused the Great Depression. It causes financial panics that uh, when we're on a gold standard, uh, you know, they, they have this long list of panics, but the, the main one they go to is the Great Depression in the United States, conventionally dated from 1929 to 1940. Uh, 1940. Uh, and we can't have gold anymore because we don't want any more of these depressions. So forget that. And then the last one, this one you hear the most, most commonly, uh, 
gold has no intrinsic value. You know, it's, uh, I love when, when people say, um, you know, I'll be on TV or something, and the, the person you're talking to, you know, say, gold's just a shiny rock. I say, well, first of all, it's not a rock, it's a metal, so why don't you get that right? But uh, uh, it's just a shiny rock and has no intrinsic value, as if a paper dollar had intrinsic value. Um, so that, but but the, the reason they're up here is that these are the objections you hear. So why don't we go through these one by one? Instead of taking them at face value, instead of being intimidated when someone throws this in our face, why don't we examine these? Why don't we look at facts, look at history, and do some analysis and see if any of this holds up? So let's take the first one. There's not enough gold to support finance and commerce. All right, well, let's do this empirically. So first of all, um, What's the, uh, what, what is the money supply? What's supporting commerce? M1 money supply. Well, if you take the major economies, US, China, Eurozone, Japan, you could throw in Australia and Canada, it wouldn't change the, the numbers very much. There's $24 trillion of what's called M1, which is a, a broad definition of, of money. By the way, it's interesting that central banks, uh, at least the, the US Federal Reserve, but I believe this is true of central banks in the world, uh, they, have, uh, they have M0, which is uh, base money, they have M1 which is base money plus checking accounts, and then they have M2, uh, which is sort of base money plus checking accounts. I think they throw in traveler's checks and uh, you know, money market funds and a few other things. Right away, it's like, oh, you got three different definitions of money? You don't even know what money is. Uh, so, right, so the fact that the central banks have multiple defin definitions of money tells you that they're playing games. But let's just take M1. That's, that's a pretty good measure. It's $24 trillion. How much gold is there? Uh, well, the official gold in the world is about 33,000 metric tons. Um, so how much gold do you need to have a gold standard? Right? Remember the objection, there's not enough gold to support finance and commerce. Well, how much gold would you actually need? Well, here we have to, in talking about the design of a gold standard, we have to make a couple assumptions. And people say, oh, I want to go back to the gold standard. And they pound the table. Let's have the gold standard. And you say, well, what do you mean by gold standard? And they don't know what they mean. Uh, well, every gold standard is some relationship between paper money and gold. It's some kind of relationship. But what is the relationship? First of all, how much money are you putting in your gold standard? Is M0, M1, M2? Makes a big difference. Um, how much gold backing do you want? Well, an Austrian economist would say, you know, it's got to be 100%, 100% or nothing, you know. Other, if you don't have 100%, you're using fractional reserve banking and all that. Historically, that's not true. Uh, the uh, UK ran a very successful gold standard in the 19th century with 20% backing. At any one time, the Bank of England had about 20% uh, physical gold to back up the, uh, their banknotes. Uh, throughout most of the 20th century, the United States ran a gold standard with 40% backing. It was actually the law that the uh, Federal Reserve was not allowed to uh, create money that was more than two and a half times the amount of physical gold uh, valued at a fixed price that was in the possession of the, of the Fed or the U.S. Treasury. Uh, so, um, you know, two and a half times money means 40% gold backing. So I'm using the number of 40% uh, because it seems conservative. It seems to, history says you can do it. 40% is high enough probably, again, our old friend confidence, you have to inspire confidence, so let's just take 40%. So, um, so if you have $24 trillion of money, which we do, and about 33,000 tons of gold, uh, if you're gonna back at 40%, you need $9.6 trillion worth of gold. That's just, that's just 40% of 24 trillion. So we need $9.6 trillion worth of gold. Well, I said there's 33,000 tons, I'm using 1,300 per ounce, you know, it fluctuates day to day. That comes to 1.5 trillion. Aha, not enough. We need 9.6 trillion. We only have 1.5 trillion. So are the critics right? There's not enough gold to support a gold standard? No. It's just a question of price. There's always enough gold. Whenever anyone says to you there's not enough gold for anything, say there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. You have to get the price right. What's the right price? Well, it's round numbers, about $8,265 per ounce. If you take the same amount of gold, 33,000 tons, at uh, 82.65 per ounce, it comes to $9.6 trillion, voila. There is enough gold in the world to support commerce, to support trade, to support payments, to support all the things people say they want. You just have to get the price right. And so, um, and by the way, I have a forecast, an intermediate term forecast of $10,000 per ounce gold. Uh, you know, I don't know if any of you are hunters, but when you, uh, you, when you aim at a bird, you don't aim at the bird, you aim ahead of it, and the bird kind of flies into the bullet. Uh, by the time we get around to this, this number will be $10,000 because they're still printing, they're still adding to the money supply. So the money supply is going up, 
the gold supply is not going up that fast. So uh, it's, it changes all the time, but uh, uh, if you update that, that would be uh, close to $10,000 an ounce and it's gonna get there. So here's the point. I'm not saying there will definitely be a gold standard, let alone a gold standard tomorrow. What I'm saying is if you have a gold standard, if you have a loss of confidence in paper money and you have to go to a gold standard to support the money system, support the monetary system, you have to get the price right because if the price is too low, you create a very powerful deflationary bias and you do cause depressions, that's true. But if you get the price right, it's not deflationary at all and it works perfectly and actually gives you a discipline on a going forward basis. So this objection falls down. When people say there's not enough gold, you can look at them and say, that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of getting the price right. So let's go to the second objection. They say, gold supply does not grow fast enough to support growth. Well, again, let's look at this empirically. So uh, how much does the uh, gold supply grow? Well, it's about 1.6% per, per year. So all the mining output in the world, Australia is a big producer, you know, throw in Russia and China and the US and Canada and Ghana and a few other, uh, South Africa and a few other places. All the gold in the world adds about 1.6% per year to the stock of gold. How much does the world economy grow? Well, it grows about 2.9% a year. That also fluctuates in a good year. It could be three and a quarter in a year like 2008. It might have been closer to two, but you know, that's, that's a, a good estimate. Well, what about that? If gold is growing 1.6% a year and the economy is growing 2.9% a year, isn't it true that gold cannot keep up with the economy and you create an inflationary bias. Again, nonsense, it's not true. Why? Because we're talking about the official gold, but remember there's 150,000 tons of gold that's owned by private citizens. If, you, if you're a central bank, if you're a government and you want to increase the gold supply, you don't need miners, you just go buy it. So all you have to do, here's an Indian bride, Indian brides in their dowries are famous for getting lots of gold. Here's our friend, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank. All they have to do is print money, um, give it to the bride and a lot of other people, and then buy the private gold. In other words, this is a red herring. Mining output is not a constraint on the ability of governments to increase the supply of gold. All they have to do is go buy some. Um, they, could, they could call Daryl and as good as gold and, and, and buy some if you're the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia. My point is, I'm trying to make the point that when people throw these objections at you, don't be intimidated. Don't take it at face value. The people, the, the PhD economists who are putting the objections out, they actually don't know what they're talking about. We're, we're trying to go through it here. So, so it is true that mining output uh, grows more slowly than the global economy, but mining output is not a constraint on the ability of central banks to get gold. All they have to do is print money and buy some. How do you think central banks create money supply today? They print it and buy bonds. Well, all you have to do is print it and buy gold. Uh, it's just another open market operation. Central banks can do it easily. So again, this objection um, does not uh, withstand scrutiny. Let's take the third one. Gold has no yield. Gold has no yield. Well, it's true. It doesn't have a yield. Neither do those uh, banknotes on the right-hand side of the screen. In other words, reach in your pocket, you know, pull out your, uh, your Aussie dollars, your banknotes, or I got a few U.S. dollars stashed away in my briefcase. It doesn't have a yield. Why? Because it's money. This one is actually true, but it's supposed to be true. Money has no yield. And people say, oh, whoa, wait, I got, I got money in the stock market. That has a yield. And that's not money. Those are stocks. When you, if you want yield, you have to convert your money into something else. People say, well, I have my money in the bank. Great. What is a bank deposit? Look at a balance sheet. A bank deposit is an unsecured liability of an occasionally insolvent financial institution. Now, they want you to think it's money. I got money in the bank. No, you don't. You have, you have a bank deposit, which is an unsecured liability of the financial institution. Talk to the people in Cyprus about their bank deposits. Talk to the people in Greece about their bank deposits. Uh, talk to the people around the world who have not been able to get their money. Talk to the people in Puerto Rico who couldn't get their money because the power grid was down. They lined up at the ATMs and the ATMs didn't work. Um, talk about people who, um, you know, you say, well, I'd like $10,000, please. And they, they say, well, come back in two days because uh, we don't have that much on hand. We got to order it. And by the way, a tax inspector and the supervisor will be waiting for you and we'll file a currency transaction report with the US Treasury. And we say, well, I'm an honest citizen, sorry. We're going to file that report and we'll stick it in a file uh, right next to ISIS and Osama bin Laden. And in the US, we have something called the FinCEN. FinCEN stands for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. 
Uh, but that's where the banks send what these CTRs, which are called, I'm, I'm giving this with reference to US law, but it's not much different around the world. I'm sure Australia has its equivalents. Um, but if you go to a bank and say, I'd like $10,000 in cash, please, from my own account, legitimate money, legitimate purposes, they will file a report with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network that will go in a file right next to Al Qaeda and, uh, and ISIS. So, um, so don't tell me your, your bank deposit is money. It's, it's actually the bank's money. They'll give it to you if they feel like it. Uh, and assuming the power is uh, not off. Uh, but my point is people say, I have money in the stock market. I say, no, you don't. You have stocks. I have money in real estate. No, you don't. You have real estate. I have money in the bond market. No, you don't. You have bonds. If you want money, you have to sell the stocks, sell the real estate, sell the bonds, and try to convert it to money. And by the way, when you probably want to do that, everyone else will be doing the same thing because there'll be a financial panic. The prices will be collapsing. Your so-called money will be disappearing in front of your eyes. It's like an ice cube melting in your hand. It's not money. Now, I'm not saying don't buy stocks, bonds, and real estate. You should have some stocks, bonds, and real estate. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying don't put your money in the bank. I have money in the bank. What am I going to do with it? Stick it under my uh, mattress? So yeah, well, I understand that you know we have bank deposits and stocks and bonds, but my point is don't fool yourselves into thinking that's money because it's not. It's something else. So the reason money, the stuff on the right, that's money uh, and it has no yield, and gold has no yield because gold is money. So this, this objection actually is true, but it's supposed to be true because money has no yield. All those other things are not money. Let's take the next one. Gold caused the Great Depression, financial panics, and crashes. Okay, uh, well, let's look at financial panics during the gold standard. There were a whole bunch of those, and I list them here. Uh, 1797, you know, long list. 1893 was a big one. 1929, started the Great Depression. 1920, uh, we had a um, panic. Actually, there were a few others I, I left out. I, I could make it a much longer list. Uh, how many people know that in July 1914, at the outbreak of World War I, the London Stock Exchange was closed for five months. Closed. The New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months. Um, they, closed, they closed the New York Stock Exchange at the end of July 1914. They did not reopen it until December. Now, it didn't, it didn't stop people from trading stocks. They actually bought their paper certificates and their wads of cash, and they went out on New Street, which is a little street in lower Manhattan. They traded face to face, and people took out classified ads in the paper saying, you know, we're, we're out of, they call it the curb market because they were trading on the curb in the street. So people find a way, but the point is um, there, there are lots of other uh, financial panics. Okay, but what about since the gold standard, without the gold standard, so since 1971? Well, 1973, remember the oil embargo, the U.S. stock market crashed. Uh, 1980, uh, emerging markets default. 1987, the stock market fell 22% in one day. I'm talking about U.S. stocks. So 22% um, in one day, not a week or a month. Um, if uh, Using our Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is pretty widely followed, uh, if it were to collapse 22% in one day, that would be 5,000 Dow points from today's level. I promise you, if the Dow Jones fell 500 points, it would be the only thing you'd read about on the news that night. Imagine 5,000 points. Uh, from uh, you know the 23,000 to 18,000 in one day. That happened in, on October 19th, 1987. We just had the 30th anniversary. Uh, 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. 1998, Russia long-term capital management. 2000, we had the dot-com collapse. And of course, 2008, the global financial crisis. And you know all about that. My point is, we've had panics with the gold standard. We've had panics without the gold standard. The gold standard has nothing to do with panics. Panics are caused by behavioral psychology. Panics are caused by exogenous events. Panics are caused by black swans. By the way, this morning in Adelaide, I saw my first black swan, a real one. I, uh, they're, they're, indigenous, they're indigenous to Australia. And um, of course, the reason the whole, if you know the, the black swan story, uh, Nassim Taleb uh, met him a number of times, great guy. He wrote this book, The Black Swan. And the idea was that Europeans and Americans with a Eurocentric uh, uh, attitude had only ever seen white swans, so they said all swans are white. And of course, Captain Cook uh, comes to Australia and he says, "Well, it goes back because they got some black swans in Australia," and that was a surprise to uh, to scientists and experts in Europe. So the black swan became a metaphor for you know shocking, unexpected things that no one thinks are going to happen. And you know, it seems like I think he sold like a million books. So as an author, I, I my hats off to him. Uh, so we all uh, you know we all use the phrase. Uh, outside of Australia, used the phrase black swan for unexpected events and financial panics and, um, 
you know, I use it and others use it, but it was this morning I saw my first real black swan, so it was a, a, a good memory of Adelaide. Uh, but um, the point is, panics are caused by exogenous shocks uh, and recursive functions and behavioral psychology. They have a lot of causes. They have dynamic causes. You can analyze it in, in, um, uh, in, in physics using complexity theory, dynamic systems analysis. A uh, lot of ways to think about panics, but they have nothing to do with gold. So when you know Paul Krugman says, so we had all these panics on the gold standard, I say, yeah, Dr. Krugman, no. we had a lot of panics without it. In other words, this is another red herring. This is another one of these things that people will throw at you that actually does not hold up to scrutiny. Uh, and the last one, now we get a little geeky, let's just take you back to college. Um, gold has no intrinsic value. Gold has no intrinsic value. Where did the theory of intrinsic value come from? Well, it started with David Ricardo, famous economist of the late 18th, early 19th century. And he was trying to figure out, this is in the early days of economics, he was trying to figure out, well, how, how did, where does any value come from? We say that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a keg of wine is worth so many pounds or uh, some land is worth so many pounds. Where does that value come from? So he thought about it and said, well, you know, things don't sort of fall from the sky if I'm buying a a suit of clothes, uh, you know, there was some material involved, there was some wool and silk or threads, and there was some labor involved. Um, you know, somebody had to sit there and stitch it up and make it. Uh, and so if you add up the cost of the materials um, and the cost of the labor and add that together, that's the value of the garment. That's what he meant by intrinsic value. Look at the, look at the, what's called the, what are called the factors of production, the inputs, figure out how much they cost you know, add them up, and that's the intrinsic value of the goods. So that was Ricardo's theory. Uh, along comes our friend Karl Marx in, uh, in 1848, and he said, yeah, he said, I, I, think, I think Ricardo was onto something. But, you know, those, those nasty capitalists, they own the means of production. Uh, you know, labor has its input, and materials have their input, but you need the factory. You need the capital to build the factory. And those capitalists, they control the means of production, uh, and they don't give labor their fair share. Labor is oppressed. And labor produces uh, their own wage plus a surplus, and then the capitalists capture the surplus because they own the means of production. And this was called the surplus labor theory. Uh, just a variation on intrinsic value, but he said, yeah, we have intrinsic value, but the capitalists get more than their share and labor gets less than their share. Of course, this is the basis of, of communism. Uh, and that was, that's Marxian economics. Um, well, along comes Karl Menger. In the late 19th century, Karl Menger was the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, a professor at the University of Vienna, and then in subsequent decades, many uh, distinguished graduates of the University of Vienna, from uh, uh, Joseph uh, Schumpeter, uh, Felix uh, Sommery, um, Mies, uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, and, and uh, Friedrich von Hayek, many other Austrian economists. You're all familiar with those names. But this all started with, uh, with Karl Menger. And he said, nonsense. The intrinsic value makes no sense at all. He came up with something called subjective value. And basically, it's, I'm sure you've heard the expression, something is worth, but somebody will pay for it. In other words, it doesn't matter what the, factor, what the input factors are. It doesn't matter what the factors of production are. You can make anything. But if nobody's going to pay for it, it's not worth very much. It has no value. But if somebody's going to pay a huge premium for it, it has enormous value. You know, it's just, it's, that's called the subjective theory of value, which is it's something is worth what someone else will pay for it in their subjective judgment. And this is the basis of free market economics. It's the base, basis of Austrian economics. And this is the one Austrian principle which has been adopted by all economists, Keynesians, monetarists, Austrians, uh, modern monetary theorists, all economists of all stripes agree with Menger that subjective value is, is uh, the way you value things. And that's why we have markets. That's why we have futures markets. That's why we have stock markets. Uh, it's called price discovery. Buyers and sellers come in and they hassle and they, they uh, trade back and forth and uh, somehow they settle on a price. So the next time somebody says to you, you know, gold has no intrinsic value, you should compliment them on their firm grasp of Marxian economics because their concepts have been obsolete for 140 years. Uh, so it's, it's another one of these things that people say, gold has no intrinsic value. I say, yeah, that concept has been uh, ridiculed and disregarded for 140 years. That's how out of date you are. Um, it could be nicer than that, but you take my point. It's, it's, it's one of these objections that's not an objection because it's just not true. Uh, 
So let's, uh, let's uh, summarize here. We have, a, so not enough gold to support finance. Well, there's plenty of gold. You have to get the price right. Gold supply does not go fast enough, really. Well, who cares? Just go buy some. Uh, gold has no yield. It's not supposed to. It's money. Gold caused the Great Depression. No, it didn't. Uh, that's a financial panic, and they happen with or without gold. Gold has no intrinsic value. Well, so what? It's a, it's a theory that has been disregarded by economists for 140 years. So in other words, none of the objections to gold stand up. None of the objections to gold apply. In fact, there are no objections to gold. There might be political reasons for not wanting to have a gold standard. I understand that. If, if you had a monopoly on something, would you want your competition to rise up and compete with you? No. And central banks have a monopoly on money printing. Why on earth would you want a gold standard to rise up and compete with you? By the way, they're very, very wary of Bitcoin. I, I said earlier I'm not a Bitcoin fan, but I can tell you the central banks, the IMF, Governments are watching Bitcoin. They're, going to, they're getting ready to crush it because they view it as a form of competition. The way they're going to do that is launch their own cryptocurrencies on distributed ledger technology. That's not our subject for today. But the point is, uh, if you're a central banker with a monopoly on currency, why on earth would you want gold to have a role? And so they come up with these canards. People go, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. Gold has no intrinsic value. You know, not enough gold. It's nonsense. None of it's true. None of it's true. So hopefully, oh, by the way, the other one you hear all the time, I didn't make a slide for it, but um, you know, they say, well, gold is a barbarous relic. How, how many people have heard that expression? Gold is a barbarous relic. You know, we can't have, it supposedly comes from John Maynard Keynes. John Maynard Keynes actually never said that. Um, I, uh, I actually, in researching it for my book, The New Case for Gold, I uh, had to go to a rare book dealer and get an original first edition, 1924, copy of John Maynard Keynes' theory of money because this phrase wasn't, I want to go back to the source and not rely on subsequent editions. And what he said, he used the phrase barbarous relic, but he wasn't talking about gold. He was talking about the gold exchange standard of the 1920s, which was a mess. Uh, it, was, it was a kind of gold standard, but a really bad one. And he said, even today, the gold exchange standard is a barbarous relic. Well, that's true. I agree with that. But he wasn't talking about gold. He was talking about this particular kind of very flawed gold standard. So again, people are not careful about that. So when you're, uh, you're talking about gold at a cocktail party and people try to give you one of these objections, now you can just shoot them down and, uh, and buy them a drink. Um, okay, so let's talk about, let's, uh, that's, that's our history lesson. Uh, let's move to the, uh, to the 21st century. Uh, and talk about some more up-to-date reasons uh, to buy gold. These are in addition to all the historical reasons. Uh, one is uh, cyber financial warfare, uh, the role of Russia, China, Iran, Syria, and North Korea, all of which have cyber armies, by the way, um, cyber brigades. Um, Vladimir Putin has 6,000 highly trained uh, computer hackers. They're Russian military, Russian intelligence. These are not criminal gangs. These are not teenagers in their parents' basement. These are uh, as I say, Russian, frontline Russian military brigades specializing in cyber warfare. Um, they can uh, hack your accounts. They can wipe out your accounts. They can shut down the power grid. They can shut down the central banks. Uh, and I'm not saying pull all your money out of the bank. I am saying take 10% of it out and buy some physical gold. The great thing about physical gold, you can't hack it. You can't hack it. You can't delete it. You can't erase it. Uh, the power grid could go down and like, man, the gold's still there. Uh, that's not true of the rest of your money. And to illustrate that, uh, let's just take the case of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world. You all know that. Uh, but they had a central bank. They had some reserves. Uh, and guess where they put their reserves? At the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Now, I could argue, I think I would argue and hold to the fact that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the safest bank in the world. By the way, our Federal Reserve System, we have a board of governors in Washington, and Janet Yellen is the chairman, and Jay Powell is going to be the new chairman and all that. They supervise this, but our system is actually uh, run through 12 districts, 12 regional Federal Reserve banks. They're in major cities, Boston, Philadelphia, um, Richmond, New York, San Francisco, Chicago. They're around the country. Uh, they're owned by the banks, by the way. A lot of people think the Federal Reserve System, our central bank is run by the government. It's not. Uh, the president has a role in appointing the governors, but it's owned by the banks. Um, but so I would say the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the safest bank in the world. It's not to say that any banks are really safe, but they're the safest. So poor little bang Bangladesh puts their reserves on deposit at the safest bank in the world, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Guess what happens next? 85 
million dollars disappears, gone. They have not, re they have not recovered it. Uh, the best evidence is that it was a uh, North Korean operation, North Korean hack, um, and so the money's gone. And if, and if Bangladesh had had that money in gold, they'd still have the money. No one's ever, cre no one's ever made it into that vault at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Uh, it's, uh, they made some movies about it, but uh, Manhattan is built on solid rock. And when they built that vault in the, uh, uh, in the 1910s, uh, sorry, 1920s, they just drilled and blasted through solid rock. So you can't like, you know, break in the door or something. It's, there's no door, it's just, there's, there's one little entrance that's very small, barely enough for a person to get through. So my point is, Bangladesh had their money in digital form, it's gone. If they'd had it in gold, it would not be gone. Uh, we are living in a world of threats to critical infrastructure, threats to the power grid, threats of war, much of which is conducted in cyberspace, and your money can disappear in a heartbeat and good luck getting it back. So I, again, I don't say put all your money into gold, I would never say that, and I don't think that's good advice, but if pe for people who don't have 10% in gold, I don't know how they sleep at night, uh, because uh, if the rest of it disappears, you'll still have that, you'll still have that physical gold. Now, uh, there's something else going on. I want to introduce, a lot of you have probably seen this or you're familiar with it, and I apologize if it's a little bit difficult to read, but this is something called John Exter's Pyramid. John Exter was the, the person who came up with this infographic. And obviously it's an, an inverted pyramid where you start out with something small down here and then you rest more and more and more stuff on it. So um, in Exter's Pyramid, you start with gold. That's real money. And then on top of that, you put uh, some, uh, some fiat money uh, bank, you know, uh, central bank money. And on top of that, you put bank deposits, bonds, money market funds, and other kinds of near money. Uh, and then on top of that, we have uh, corporate debt, and then we have junk bonds, and then we have derivatives on the junk bonds, derivatives on the corporate debt. Uh, and then, uh, you know, finally, again, uh, uh, more, more derivatives of derivatives, et cetera. And this, this slice here, actually the whole thing, um, is approaching one quadrillion dollars. That's a thousand trillion dollars. Bear in mind, I said earlier that the, uh, the M1 uh, money supply is about 24 trillion. Well, 24 trillion's a big number, but try a thousand trillion, meaning that the system is leveraged, the paper money system is leveraged at 50 to one, Le leave alone the fact that there's only a certain amount of gold under the paper money system. But, th but this is the extra pyramid. Now here's what's going on. This is physical gold. I'm not talking about gold futures, uh, gold forwards, gold options, gold ETFs. I'm not talking about any other kind of gold. It's physical gold. This is shrinking. Now, the total amount of gold in the world is increasing, but the amount available to the monetary system is decreasing. I was recently in Switzerland. I met with, you know, when I go to Switzerland, I don't really talk to the bankers. Sometimes I do, but I talk to the gold people. I talk to refiners. I talk to secure logistics people, people who run vaults, armored cars who do deliveries, people who handle the physical gold. I talked to gold dealers. I've been to China recently, and I, I spoke to the major bank gold dealers there, uh, the major players on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And I, I do, this, uh, do this all over the world. Um, and what they tell me when I, when I spoke to the private storage, they said, well, we can't build our vaults fast enough. They're actually, the, the Swiss Army during the Cold War hollowed out some mountains, and they made these nuclear bomb-proof mountain fortresses, so if you dropped a nuclear bomb on it, nothing would happen inside, and they put provisions and troops and armaments and vehicles and all that stuff. Well, one by one, the Swiss Army is abandoning these, and they're kind of putting them up for auction, and the vault people are like, we'll take them, and they, they build security perimeters around them, and they're, they're doing these deep buried mountain vaults, but I talked to uh, one of the guys, head of uh, precious metals at Loomis, which is one, they bought, um, they bought Viamat, which is one of the big secure logistics provider. These guys are the biggest in the world. They say, we can't build the vaults fast enough. They say, what's happening is that customers are taking their gold out of the banks, out of Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, um, uh, UBS, and others, and they're moving it to us. So when that happens, the total gold supply is unchanged. You take it out of the bank, you move it over to my friends at Loomis, the total gold supply is unchanged, but the floating supply went down. Because when gold is in private storage, when gold is in a private vault, it's not available to support this pyramid. You know, you need a little bit of real gold. If you're gonna have a gold futures contract, you need a little bit of real gold. And if you're gonna have a central bank, you need some gold. All the, all the major central banks have gold. They don't like to talk about it, but they have some. So you need, you need a little gold down here to support this but what's happened is that this is shrinking. Um, as I say, people are pulling it out of the banking system, putting it into private storage. So this pyramid looks a little, looks like it could tip over. 
what's going to happen when this gets bigger and bigger and this gets smaller and smaller? The whole thing becomes more unstable and is more likely to tip over, and of course it will, uh, depending on the catalyst. Could be a war, natural disaster, uh, political disruption. Um, it, it could be a lot of things, but uh, the point is the instability is increasing. Now, on top of that, uh, we're seeing the beginnings of a war on gold. And before I talk about the war on gold, I want to talk about the war on cash. And I referred to that a little bit already. Uh, governments around the world are trying to get rid of cash. Uh, why? Well, uh, two reasons. Number one, they want to impose negative interest rates. So that's where you put $100,000 in the bank. And uh, well, until recently, you put $100,000 in the bank. And if there was a 5% interest rate it came back a year later, and there was $105,000 in the bank. They gave you 5% interest. A negative interest rate is when they say, you put your $100,000 in the bank, you come back a year later, and there's only 99000 That's a 1% negative interest rate. That's where they take your money away. That's what a negative interest rate is. This is happening. This is not some uh, science fiction fantasy. It's happened in Switzerland, Sweden, um, Europe, uh, Japan. They've all imposed negative interest rates. One of the reasons they say they do it is because, you know, we want to get the economy moving. We want to get people lending and spending. And if we have negative interest rates, it's good to be a borrower because the bank pays you to borrow. And it's not good to be a saver because we're going to take your money away. And so people will go lend and spend and get the economy moving and increase nominal GDP and all that. Hasn't worked out that way, by the way. It's not, I'm, I'm digressing into a little bit of a technical economics lecture. But the evidence on negative interest rates is they have the opposite effect. You go through the looking glass. Uh, specifically, people have lifetime savings goals, uh, their retirement, their kids' education, their parents' health care, their own health care, whatever it may be. If you take their money away with a negative rate, guess what people do? They save more. They're like, well, I still got to meet my goals. You're taking my money away, so I better save more. Uh, and what signal does the central bank send when they impose a negative interest rate? Well, what they're saying is, we're worried about deflation. We want you to lend and spend. To get, not, uh, to get inflation going, we're worried about deflation. Well, if you're worried about deflation, I'm just going to defer my purchases because that means prices are going down. So in, they're trying to encourage lending and spending and increases in nominal GDP, but what they actually get is people save more and defer savings, de sorry, defer spending, the exact opposite of what the central banks want. Really good example of how PhD economists don't know anything about people. They know a lot about their theories. They know a lot about what goes on in the lab, but they don't know anything about how real people in the real world um, respond to these incentives or disincentives. But, uh, but, but one of the reasons they want the negative rates, they have this view of, of, of uh, the negative rates work, but they know that if you have negative interest rates, all I have to do to defeat that is go get my cash. So let's say we have two people, you know, me and another person, we both have $100,000 in the bank, and you put on a negative 1% interest rate. So my friend over here does nothing. I go down to the bank. I get my $100,000, put it in a vault, put it in a safe place. One year later, I still have $100,000, and my friend has $99,000. In other words, the way a, an everyday citizen can beat a negative interest rate is to take your cash out of the bank. Well, what if there was no cash? See, that's the thing. They're trying to get rid of cash so they can impose negative interest rates so they can take your money. And this is what I mean by the war on cash. Um, you know, when you slaughter pigs, the first thing you do is herd all the pigs into a pen and then take them into a chute and you slaughter them. That's what they're trying to do to savers. They're trying to force everybody into one of a small number of big banks. All, you know, so all the little banks are going away. The big banks are getting bigger. Force you in, no more cash. You have to have a digital account and then they'll slaughter you with negative interest rates. So that's the plan. It's, it's taken a while to work out. Again, we've seen concrete examples of this. Uh, Australian. Parliament about a year ago proposed getting rid of the 100 uh, Australian dollar bill. They still have them, uh, although I noticed the ATMs only give me 50s. But um, uh, anyone got a 100 Australian note on them? Uh, well, you can tell me later. But the point is, they're trying to make those go away. The United States, until the late 1960s, had a 500 dollar bill. Um, I remember as a kid, you, you, they weren't common. I didn't get one for allowance, but you, I saw some 500 dollar bills. They got rid of the 500 in 1968. They, therefore, the biggest bill was 100. But interestingly, the value of the $100 bill in 1968 compared to today, it's lost 80% of its purchasing power. So a $100 bill today is, was, would have been a $20 bill in 1968. So they don't even have to tell you that you can't have a $100 bill. All they have to do is make it worthless. And pretty soon, you know, eventually, it'll be worth a dollar. Look at India. Of course, you all know what happened there just about a year ago this month or last month. 
they woke up one day and the two most popular forms of money were illegal. You went to bed and you woke up and the 5,000 and 2,000 rupee notes were illegal. Uh, and I said, you got any? Well, come down to the bank and put them in and we'll give you a digital account and you can pay for it with your iPhone. Uh, oh, by the way, the tax guy will be waiting behind the counter to ask you where you got the money. Um, and uh, the Indian economy almost collapsed overnight. Uh, it was a complete disaster. On top of the sort of idiocy of doing that, they said well, they knew that they were going to introduce a new rupee note, a larger denomination rupee note. But so we're getting rid of all the old ones because uh, we want to force all your people to open digital accounts. <laughs> they got the engravers to print the new notes. They were the wrong size for the ATMs, so they couldn't even. They, they had to go out and reprogram every ATM in India. It's a lot of ATMs to get those to work. So those things didn't work for a while. So it was complete and utter chaos. By the way, it turns out that the vast majority of all the all the uh, rupees that were turned in, completely legitimate. You know, these were not tax evaders or money launderers or drug dealers or whatever. They were just farmers and fishermen and villagers and um, you know, housewives and people with a dowry and uh, and others who just preferred cash. They had a preference for cash. Uh, what a crime! So, um, but as you go around the world, you see this more and more. It's talked about. It's studied. It's happening. Uh, there is this full-scale war on cash. Well, I have a simple answer for the war on cash. If it gets bad enough, if you actually do make it 100% digital, if you, if you get rid of all the paper notes, just get some gold, right? Because uh, right now, and I tell people, right now you can take cash and go buy gold. Nobody is stopping you. Nobody is stopping you. But there may come a time when there is no cash. Can't have it. You got a digital card. Oh, you want to buy gold? Well, not only is the government monitoring that transaction, maybe completely legitimate, but Big Brother is watching. But you may find that you can't get the gold either, that they begin to regulate that. So the time to get your gold is right now. Um, and uh, that's a solution to, so, so you can't have a war on, there is a war on cash for the reasons I mentioned, which are negative interest rates. But you can't have a war on cash without having a war on gold, because if you eliminate cash, people will just switch to gold, that's easy. So you got to come after gold too. So right now is the time to get your gold. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's switch a little bit to economics, and I think this will come back to uh, our, our main subject. The Fed. We, I'll, I'll use the Federal Reserve. It's uh, you know I know it's America's central bank, but uh, look, the U.S. dollar, for better or worse, is 60% of global payment. Uh, sorry, 60% of global reserves, 80% of global payments almost 100% of all the oil shipments. This is changing, but for now, uh, oil is priced overwhelmingly in dollars. So um, for better or worse, uh, whatever happens with the dollar and the Federal Reserve affects everybody in the world. You know, in the 1970s, um, when Richard Nixon uh, went off the gold standard and was negotiating with the French and the Japanese and the Germans for devaluation, the Secretary of the uh, Treasury, John Connolly, made a very famous remark. He's, with regard to the dollar, he said, it's our currency, but it's your problem. And that was how he, uh, how he negotiated with the Japanese. He's probably right about that. So, uh, so let's talk about the Fed a little bit as a, as a kind of a global men benchmark. They have a conundrum. The world wants to deflate. There is very little doubt that the natural state of the world today, when I say natural, I mean you know, unaffected by uh, central bank intervention, unaffected by manipulation, unaffected by policy, that the world wants to deflate. And there are reasons for this. Uh, demographics are one. Uh, any economy, the, the notional value of the output of any economy is simply the sum of who's working and how productive are they. Now, you can slice and dice GDP any way you want, but it's actually that simple. How many people are working? How productive are they? If a lot of people are working and they're productive and those are growing, you're going to have a booming economy. If the population is flat or declining and productivity is going down, you're going to have a sinking economy. Well, look around. The population of Japan is declining. The population of Russia is declining. The population of China is flatlining. The population of the United States used to go up a little bit, mainly because of immigration, not because of the natural birth rate. And President Trump is really curtailing immigration. So our um, population, our workforce is beginning to flatline. Uh, same thing in Europe. This is happening all over the world. Of course, the places where uh, population is booming are uh, is Africa, but they don't have the productivity or the capital, at least yet, to uh, kind of pick up the baton and run with it. So uh, you have that, um, the, the, the demographic vector. Uh, debt, um, 
the evidence is very good that when uh, debt to GDP exceeds 90 percent, in other words, when a country's debt burden is more than 90 percent of its annual output, uh, that additional debt actually reduces output. It not only do you not get more output, uh, you, you don't even break even. It actually goes down. Um, by the way, economies in, in 1981, the U.S. debt to GDP ratio was 35 percent. Today, it's 105 percent. The research is pretty clear that 90% is, uh, is a red line. When you go past 90%, you're in this death zone where you cannot borrow and spend your way out of the debt spiral. You're just going to default. It's just a matter of time. Uh, but all the major economies are there. China's worse. Europe's worse. Um, you know, don't even get me started on Greece. Uh, Italy's worse, et cetera. Japan is far worse. So all these companies, you know, I said U.S. is 105%, which it is. Japan is about 240%. Um, so these countries are all in the death zone. They cannot borrow and spend their way out of it, uh, and more debt just makes the problem worse. So, so debt is a drag on growth. Uh, Deleveraging, um, again, uh, after uh, 2008, remember for Americans at least, the, two, the global financial crisis of 2008 came very soon after the dot-com meltdown of 2000 when the NASDAQ, one of our major stock indices, dropped 80% uh, between January uh, 1st, 2000 and uh, the end of, uh, of 2001, dropped 80% from the 5,000 level to, uh, to below 2,000. Um, and, uh, and, and, those, and of course it was worse in 2008, and when people are in distress, they sell assets to get money to pay off their debts. So they're just deleveraging. What happens when you sell assets? Price goes down. Uh, so now you gotta sell more assets. The, 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 by the way, when you sell assets and the price goes down, your debt doesn't go down. Your debt stays the same. So you gotta sell more and more assets to pay off the debt. That's a deleveraging uh, spiral. Irving Fisher wrote a, a, a short monograph on this in the 1920s called The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions. Uh, but that uh, evidence is very good. And the last one is technology, and I don't need to explain this. You, you all know your, your laptops and your iPhones and your iPads and a lot of other things are a lot cheaper now than they were not that long ago. Some prices are going up, I get that, but a lot of uh, prices are, are coming down, textiles close, um, they're practically giving some of this stuff away. So uh, demographic debt to leveraging technology create a naturally deflationary world. But central banks cannot tolerate deflation. Central banks cannot have deflation. Why? Two reasons. Number one, governments don't know how to tax it. So let me give you a very simple example. So let's say you make $50,000 and you go ask your boss for a raise and the boss says, okay, I'll give you a 10% raise. Now you're making $55,000. Uh, but let's assume prices are constant. So my example, your salary went up 10%, $5,000, but the prices are the same. But what does the government do? They come along and take half of it. They take half, they, they know how to tax that $5,000 raise. Uh, they take you know, roughly half of it depending on the country. But imagine another scenario where you're making the same $50,000. You go ask your boss for a raise. Your boss says, you're crazy. You're lucky I don't fire you. Get out of here. You're still making $50,000, but prices drop 10%. Prices drop by $5,000. Well, you're richer. You're better off. You're making the same $50,000, but the price of everything, you know, movie tickets, gas at the pump, food at the store, et cetera, is less. So your standard of living went up. You're richer. But guess what? Governments haven't figured out how to tax that. They know how to tax the gains from inflation. They don't know how to tax the gains from deflation. So what do governments think of deflation? They hate it because they can't tax it. So that's one reason governments cannot tolerate deflation. It actually destroys, it increases the real value of debt, and destroys the tax base, which ultimately destroys the power of government. So they're not going to allow it. So you have this situation where the world wants to deflate, but central banks and governments will not, cannot allow it to deflate for the reason I mentioned, there are other reasons as well. So they have to fight back. Well, how do they do that? Well, what's in the toolkit? Well, I, you know the list, zero interest rate policy, negative interest rate policy, quantitative easing, operation twist, forward guidance, pause, helicopter money, currency wars. These are all different ways of trying to create inflation. The central bank, uh, uh, well, certainly in the United States, but central banks of the world have tried every one of them in the last 10 years, and it's not working. Uh, but that, that just means they have to try harder. So we're in this, we're in this world where, think of it as too, you know, familiar with uh, um, tectonic plate theory. It's not theory, it's pretty well, pretty good science. So you have one tectonic plate, you know, coming in from the Pacific Ocean, and we have another tectonic plate that's the continental U.S., and they're pressing up against each other. And right where they press up, that's a fault line. It's where earthquakes happen. And they can be very 
they can appear to be very stable for a long period of time. So you have the deflationary vector and the inflationary vector. Not much is happening right now, but that dynamic instability is going to snap. Same way you have an earthquake. Um, I went out uh, not long ago, I was in, took a tour in the desert out in uh, uh, Coachella Valley, California, and my guy took me out to the San Andreas Fault out in the desert. And you can actually see it because it's a little crack in the air, so some water that percolates up. So there's a strip of greenery, some trees and stuff, in the middle of the desert. Well, that's the fault. And I'm, you know, I'm a wise guy, so I went out and I put one, one leg on each side of the San Andreas Fault, and I stood there, and nothing was happening. But that doesn't mean it was dynamically stable. That doesn't mean I wasn't in a very dangerous position. It doesn't mean that an earthquake isn't coming. Of course, it's extremely unstable just because it's not shaking on any given day. And that's the way you should understand prices today. Not much is happening, but there are powerful deflationary and inflationary forces pushing against each other, setting up a major break, which could go either way. So this is, uh, this is the, the dilemma that the central banks are, are facing. Now, let me take that take that dynamic which I just described, and this is what I call the Mick Jagger theory of economics. You know, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones had a song, you can't always get what you want. And my point is central banks want inflation, but they can't get it, at least not so far. Uh, people say, well, how, could the central, how could the Federal Reserve print $4 trillion? Where's the inflation? Well, I'll explain that in a second. So, so let's uh, spend a second with the quantity theory of money. By the way, this is PhD level economics. But it's really easy, I promise. So, uh, so the quantity theory of money, we have, we have this equation, MV equals PQ. Well, M is the money supply. Let's see how much money is there, okay? V is the velocity of money. What's velocity? Well, that's turnover. So um, let's say I go out tonight and I'm feeling good, and I, uh, I go to the bar, and I, uh, I have a drink, and I tip the bartender. And the bartender takes my tip and takes the taxi home and tips the taxi driver. And the taxi driver takes the tip money and goes to a gas station and buys a tank of gas. That, my dollar has velocity of three. We supported three dollars of transactions, the bar tip, the taxi tip, and the gasoline, three dollars of transactions on one dollar. That's velocity of three. But what if I don't feel so good? I stay home and watch TV. That, my money has velocity of zero because I didn't spend it. And I like to remind people that four trillion dollars times zero is zero. In other words, if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. So velocity is, is a psychological concept, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, and then there's the price index. That's inflation or deflation. And Q is the real GDP. So that's the increase in nominal GDP minus inflation. So look at how much you actually grew. Subtract the inflation part because that's not real, and what's left is, is real. So the equation, MV equals PQ, is so the money supply times velocity equals nominal GDP and has two parts, uh, the real part and the price index. Well, that makes sense, right? How much money is there? How, f how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other, and that's the gross notional value of your goods and services. And if some of it's inflation, you know, that's not real. Now, Milton Friedman, who was the, uh, at least recently, the father of uh, this quantity theory of money, the theory itself is older, he said, uh, a mature economy like Australia or the United States or the UK or Germany or some others can only kind of grow about 3.5% a year. You know, in the short run, it could grow more. Uh, in, in periods of recession, it'll grow less. But the trend can only be 3.5% approximately. But that goes back to what I said earlier, how many people are working and how productive are they. So if your population is going up 1.5% and your productivity is going up 1.5%, Add them together, you get 3% um, growth. But that's all you can get. You don't have any more people, you don't have any more productivity. Any nominal growth in excess of the 3%, in my example, is inflation. You can have nominal growth, but it's not real. It's, it's inflationary. So Friedman said, well, OK, um, central banking is easy. If, uh, and he assumed that velocity was constant. So he said, if this can only be, if that can only be 3%, right, because that's the real part, and we want that to be 1, and that was Q times 1 is Q, so we don't want any inflation or deflation, so in this equation, P would be 1, that would be ideal. Q can only be 3%, that's as good as it gets. A V is constant. So all we have to do is increase the money supply by 3% a year, and we'll get maximum uh, real GDP growth with no inflation. That's central bank in Nirvana. And Milton Friedman used to say, well, we don't need central bankers. We need a computer just to increase the money supply about 3% a year. Um, 
Well, uh, that turns out not to be true. Milton Friedman missed a big variable, which is so. Here's, here's the money supply over here. So this is what's been happening. So we go back to 2008. U.S. Uh, base money was $800 billion. So here's QE1. You can see it. Then QE1 ended. It kind of goes sideways. And here's QE2 um, around 2010, 2011. That ended. It kind of goes sideways. And then here's QE3, much bigger. And that ended in November uh, 2014. And it's been going sideways ever since. So there's the increase in the money supply. Well, gee, if that goes up, and that's constant, where's the inflation? Why hasn't, uh, why hasn't nominal GDP gone up you know, 100% with 3% 3 3 real growth and 97% inflation? Well, the answer is velocity is not constant. Velocity has been collapsing. And it did not start in 2008. Here's 2008. Okay, it fell very sharply there. But it started in 1998, back at the time of the Russia, LTCM, Asian financial crisis. So the point is, uh, money supply has nothing to do with inflation. Uh, inflation is caused by velocity, and velocity is psychological. So if people feel what Keynes called animal spirits, say, I want to go out and you know, take my friends to dinner and buy drinks for everyone at the bar, that's one state of the world. But if I want to stay home and watch TV, that's a different state of the world. And people are actually, at least monetarily depressed. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know if people are happy or depressed, but we're monetarily depressed. We don't feel like spending our money. We feel like saving our money or paying down debt or reducing leverage, et cetera. And this is the collapse of velocity. So my point is, central bankers are desperate to get inflation. This is what they've been doing about it. But they're fighting collapsing velocity. And you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money and decreasing velocity. What are central banks doing right now? They're decreasing the money supply. They've been increasing it for 10 years. But the, uh, the tapers you've heard about, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates. The U.S. Federal Reserve has started to decrease the balance sheet. If, if I update this chart in six months, this number is going to come down. It's starting to come down. Oh, wait a second. Now you're decreasing money supply and decreasing velocity? You're going to kill nominal GDP. You're going to cause a recession. Central bankers don't see this. The reason is they think velocity is constant. They kind of ignore this. This, this is data. I'm, I'm funny that way. I actually look at real data instead of making up theories that bear no relationship to reality. Uh, but here's, here's the actual data. This is velocity. Now, if you, if you believe in unicorns and you think that this is going to turn around, fine. But there's no evidence that it has or that it will. So get ready for some recessions in the years ahead. Um, now, here's the point. Let me take all this, uh, this economics lecture digression and bring it back to gold. Um, the Fed can cause 150% inflation in 15 minutes. I just told you that they've been trying for 10 years to cause inflation, and they failed. But they can cause 150% inflation in 10 minutes. How do they, well, 15 minutes, yeah, maybe 20 minutes. But how, how, how do they do this? What they do is they have a board meeting. They go in, they close the doors, they take a vote, and they say, from now on, gold is $3,000 an ounce, because we say so. And they come out, and they announce this to the world, and they make it stick. How do you make the price stick? Well, you do it with open market operations. So we got a Federal Reserve that can print money. And we got a big pile of gold. And what we tell the world is, come and get it. Gold's $3,000 an ounce. You think it's cheap? Come and get it. Um, and you think it's expensive? We'll buy it from you. So if you see the price of gold dropping to $29.25, for example, it's a 5% uh, decline, uh, the Fed will buy it. The Fed will say, okay, we're, we'll just print money and buy your gold uh, all you want. And if you see gold getting expensive, 30, 75, my example, they sell it. They just sell it in the market. Well, when you sell it, you knock the price down. And when you buy it, you bring the price up. So this is called a trading range. You can enforce it with open market operations. Well, if you're a buyer at $29.25 and you're a seller at $30.75, you're targeting a price of $3,000 an ounce. And they can make that stick. They got 8,000 tons in a printing press. That's enough gold. That's enough ink to make that price stick. Um, and well, guess what? That's a 150% increase in the price of gold from today. But gold didn't change in value. The fact that the dollar value of gold went up to $3,000 an ounce doesn't change what gold is. What really happened was the dollar was devalued. That's a 60% devaluation of the dollar. And this has to do with the concept of the numerator. So people say, oh, gold went up, gold went down. Why do you say that? You're, you're privileging the dollar as a numerator. What if you hold gold constant, right? And when I think about gold, I don't think about it in dollars. I think of it in weight. I say, well, how many ounces, how many kilos, how many tons, you know, as the case may be. To me, that's the right way to think about gold. That's making gold the anchor either of a central 
bank monetary system or your own personal monetary system. I tell people, you don't have to wait for governments to go on a gold standard. You can go on your own gold standard. Just go buy some gold, nobody's stopping you. Um, but when you, uh, when you increase the value of, the, when you increase the dollar value of gold, it's not that gold's going up. Gold's still gold, right? Atomic number 79, it didn't change. The dollar went down. The world of $3,000 gold, nothing happens in isolation. If you, if you say gold's $3,000, you're going to get $100 oil, $50 silver, $6 copper, et cetera. In other words, you're going to create the inflation you want. So central banks, going back to the uh, two slides ago, uh, central banks are fighting deflation. They're desperate to fight it. They can't, they can't get what they want. Uh, but eventually, they'll have to, because particularly if velocity keeps going down. And they will want their last resort. They're not going to do this tomorrow. They don't want to do this. I'm not suggesting you should look for this in the, in the next three or six months. What I am saying is one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to get the inflation, in which case your gold is going to go up, or they're going to make the price of gold go up to cause the inflation, in which case your gold is going to go up. So it, it does very well either way. And just to illustrate that, because I don't like to make claims, I, I've given you the economic analysis, but let's look at history. So take the Great Depression. Um, depending on how you date it. So 1927 and 1933, that's a, a slice of the Great Depression. In the United States of America, we had 30% deflation, not inflation, deflation in that seven-year period. That was the longest period of sustained deflation in U.S. history. Down, prices down 33%. What did gold do? It went up 70%. In 1927, gold was $20 an ounce. In 1933, it was $35 an ounce. Gold went up 70% in a period of deflation. There's, there's the data right there. Okay, what about the great inflation, 1976 to 1981? In that six-year period, we had 55% inflation, not 15, 55. Um, and what happened to gold? Went up 300%, started, uh, started 1976, gold was $150 an ounce. In 1981, it was $600 an ounce. So gold went up 300%. So here's my point. Gold goes up in deflation, and it goes up in inflation. Gold wins both ways. So don't let anyone tell you that you know, gold's not money. Gold's the constant. What's going on is the dollar is fluctuating. But whether it's inflation or deflation, gold always wins. And I've just given you the math, the economics, and the history to demonstrate that. And again, there's something else going on in the world today, which is that the United States has been very, very successful at financial warfare. Uh, and I spoke earlier, I was invited by the Pentagon, by the U.S. Department of Defense, to conduct the first ever financial war game. Um, is, we did this in 2009 at the Applied Physics Laboratory. It's a top secret weapons laboratory, uh, halfway between Baltimore and Washington. Uh, the Pentagon didn't need any help from me in doing war games. They had been doing those for decades, but they had never done a financial war game before. So they invited me in as as a financial expert, and I, I called it uh, you know, playing risk for adults, if you know the old uh, Parker Brothers board game, Risk. Um, we had to you know, write the rules that had never been done before. Was it going to be one day, or two days, or three days, or what would the teams be? Would they be countries? Would they be banks? Uh, how many moves would you make? Uh, what would the scenarios be? We, so we had to figure all that out, and we did, and put packages together, and invited uh, about 100 experts to play on the different teams, and uh, we had observers from the Treasury, the Fed, uh, CIA, the military, uh, we had a three-star general in the, behind, you know, sort of smoke glass observing this financial war game. It was a really interesting experience. Um, I not only got to plan and facilitate it, but I was invited to um, play on one of the teams. And uh, when I got home, after a couple days being in the lab, I, I said to my wife, uh, I have good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is my team won. Uh, bad news is I played China. Uh, so uh, that was... Uh, this is all uh, covered in my book, uh, Currency Wars. It's the first two chapters in Currency Wars, so I won't spend too much time on it, but you kind of get the whole story there. Um, but the problem is the United States has become a victim of its own success, meaning we throw your weight around long enough. If you're the bully on the schoolyard long enough, what happens to bullies? Uh, well, all the people they're beating up, they get together, form a gang, and they, they beat up the bully, right? So something like that is happening in world finance today, that countries are sick and tired of uh, being the subject of sanctions and financial warfare by the United States. We're using the privileged position of the dollar to throw our weight around. Now, sometimes that's completely justified. I think, uh, you know, North Korea, their oxygen should be cut off, and uh, dollars are oxygen when it comes to an economy. 
and that's fine, but we've used them uh, in a lot of other cases uh, with a lot of other countries, and they're not too happy about it. So they're forming their own uh, axis, and I call it the axis of gold. Uh, charter members are China, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Of course, two of them are subject to sanctions today, Russia and Iran. Uh, China, their financial institutions are being sanctioned, and Turkey, uh, they're sort of spoiling for a fight. But um, what they're doing, they are acquiring massive amounts of gold. Uh, Russia has tripled its gold reserves in the last 10 years. China has more than tripled its gold reserves in the last 10 years. Uh, Iran is non-transparent. Iran has acquired a lot of gold. No one knows exactly how much because they're not transparent about it. A lot of the gold in Iran is coming from Turkey. It used to go through Dubai, but you know, Dubai kind of put pressure on them. So it's coming through Turkey. They're just flying plane loads of gold from, uh, uh, from Istanbul to uh, Tehran. Uh, so these are the charter members of the, of the um, what I call the axis of gold. Why are they doing this? Because they can pay each other in gold that bypasses the dollar payment system. They don't have to use digital transactions. You can uh, literally fly the gold around. North Korea is selling weapons, nuclear weapons, and missile technology to Iran. We know this. This is one of the reasons we're going to go to war with North Korea. I'll talk about that in a minute. But how does Iran pay North Korea? They can't send them dollars through SWIFT. They're both banned from SWIFT. Uh, Iran was until recently, North Korea still is. They send them gold. They, they literally move the gold around. Now, they're taking that a step further, which is they're building a, dig, a distributed ledger technology platform. A distributed ledger technology uh, used to be called the blockchain. Now the new word for it is distributed ledger technology, or DLT. Don't confuse this with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a particular currency on a distributed ledger. But forget the currency, focus on the distributed ledger. That's the technology. I don't think Bitcoin has much of a future, but distributed ledger definitely does. Uh, Russia and China are building their own DLTs. They're gonna have their own cryptocurrencies. They call it a Putin coin or a Xi coin or whatever you want. Uh, but the point is they will be able to put the gold in a central depository, you know, somewhere in Siberia maybe, and then pay each other in gold-backed digital tokens uh, to settle accounts without actually moving the gold around. And what's interesting about this is the dollar is nowhere in sight. There's no more dollar payment system. There's no more dollar numeraire. You don't have to go through Fedwire or SWIFT or Treasury or any Western bank or anything that we control. We can't interdict you. We can't stop you. It's encrypted. It's private, et cetera. So that right now they're moving physical gold because, again, you can't hack it. You can't shut it down. You can't. Uh, I guess you can shoot a plane down if it's being delivered, but that's an act of war. Uh, but right now they're selling up in physical gold, but they're moving quickly to a place where they'll have a gold depository and they'll just keep the gold there and they'll move ownership of the gold back and forth using their own private cryptocurrencies on a distributed ledger technology platform. Uh, so the future of cryptocurrencies isn't Bitcoin, it's the kind of coins I'm talking about, but the important thing is it bypasses the U.S. payment system. Well. Um, I say, okay, if Russia and China and Iran and Turkey are buying gold, good enough for them, it's good enough for me. It was that the biggest, most powerful players in the world are acquiring gold as fast as they can to build a new digital gold-backed currency. Why wouldn't you have some gold? And the U.S., by the way, I've discussed this with uh, um, U.S. Treasury officials. I, I tell them the same thing I'm telling you. It's not like, you know, it's, just, uh, it's the same thing, right? Uh, except they either don't pay attention or they laugh at you or whatever. So the U.S. will be the last to know, but this is very well documented and it, it's happening. So let's talk a little bit about uh, North Korea. We've got about 15 minutes left. We're in the home stretch here. Uh, I want to talk about what's called the logic of war, what the French call les logiques de guerre. Um, the logic of war is not the logic of diplomacy, it's not the logic of economics, it's not the logic that most people apply to problem solving. It's a logic of its own. Wars happen usually not because anybody wants a war, but because two sides misapprehend the capabilities of in and intentions of each other and they just get it wrong in some fundamental way. Uh, this is the path we're on today. So let me just take, you know, what is Kim Jong-un thinking? Um, the intelligence community assesses that Kim Jong-un is not crazy, and I agree with that. He's not crazy. He, he thinks about things differently than we do or others do, but he's, but he's not crazy. Here's what Kim Jong-un is thinking. He looks around the world, and he has four data points. Muammar Gaddafi of, Iran, uh, sorry, of, uh, of uh, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya had a nuclear weapons program. 
He gave it up because he wanted to normalize relations with the West. Mike Morrell was the deputy director of the CIA, goes to Tripoli, Gaddafi hands him the keys, we remove the fissile material, we remove the centrifuges and the equipment, no more gold standard. What happens next? We invade, he gets killed, he gets a bullet in the eye. Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapons program. He did not in 2003 when we invaded it, but he did in 1989, that's not disputed, uh, and he gave it up. Uh, what happened? We invaded and, and killed him, he got hanged. Um, Ukraine had nuclear weapons uh, left over from the Soviet Union. They gave them up, sent them back to Russia. What happens? Putin invades, he takes Crimea and half of eastern Ukraine. The Iranians have a nuclear pro weapons program. They did not give it up. They're still standing. They're still in charge. So Kim Jong-un says, well, this is easy. If you give up your nuclear weapons program, they invade you and kill you. And if you keep your nu nuclear weapons program, they don't mess with you. So he says, I'm better off with my program than without it. I'm better off with the nukes and with the missiles. And all the Western experts are saying, don't you know you're taking a risk? Don't you know this? He's like, no, I'm better off with it because you won't mess with me. Uh, and he has a lot of history to back it up. And then, of course, uh, President Obama, dealing with the Syrians, told Bashar al-Assad uh, several years ago, if you use chemical or biological weapons, there's going to be a high price to pay. You're crossing a red line. A few weeks later, Assad uses the weapons. We didn't do anything. Um, by the way, there are two rules of diplomacy. Rule number one, never give an ultimatum. Rule number two, if you give an ultimatum, back it up. Like if you break rule number one, don't forget about rule number two, back it up. Obama broke both rules. He gave an ultimatum and he didn't back it up. U.S. credibility was shot, so Kim jong Un sitting there saying, well, I got uh, Libya, Iraq, Iran, and Ukraine that tells me I ought to keep my weapons, and you Americans uh, are bluffing. Uh, you know, you're sick of war and so forth. So he, he thinks he's fine. So all this Western analysis that this guy is an idiot or crazy or making, it doesn't hold up. He's actually acting in a very rational way. The U.S., for its part, I met, um, uh, I'm on the board of a think tank in Washington that hosted a, uh, a six-hour uh, meeting with uh, Mike Pompeo, the director of the CIA, and uh, HR General H.R. McMaster, who's national security advisor to President Trump. So, you know, I was sitting as close to them as I are to the folks in the front, uh, front row here for six hours. And uh, Mike Pompeo said um, it would be imprudent to assume it will take Kim Jong-un more than five months to acquire uh, the, nuclear, the final nuclear weapons programs he needs. Now, he has the fissile material. He has the enrichment. He has the warheads. He has intermediate-range ballistic missiles. He has intercontinental ballistic missiles. We know all this because we've seen the tests. And he has an H-bomb. We've seen all these tests and have all this data. What we're not sure of, has he been able to miniaturize the warhead, put it on a missile with a reliable guidance system so it can hit the target? Those are sort of the final steps. But what, what uh, Pompeo said was that he has exceeded by years every other technological threshold he's had to meet. It would be, and his, these are his words, not mine. It would be imprudent to assume it will take him more than five months to cross the finish line and have a nuclear-tipped ICBM arsenal that can decimate the United States. So. There's your, there's your outside date. By, he said this to me on, on our group on October 20th. So by March 20th, uh, he's going to cross the finish line, if not sooner. General McMaster then said, uh, and used the word acceptance in, in reference to, will the United States accept North Korea as a nuclear power? Um, and he talked to the elites. Again, I talked about monetary elites earlier, but the foreign policy, pardon me, foreign policy elites, people like Strobe Talbot, uh, Richard Haas, um, people in the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, the editor of The Economist, all the, all the big brains. They say something like the following. The United States will not, cannot attack North Korea because the costs are too high. They're going to you know, un unleash on South Korea. There'll be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dead in Seoul. Um, this will you know, risk World War III, destabilize uh, the Western Pacific. Uh, it might have been nice if we'd done something five years ago, but we didn't. It's too late. You cannot do it. The costs are too high. You, the United States, have to rely on containment and deterrence, diplomacy, economic sanctions, as you did during the Cold War, to keep North Korea bottled up, but you can't go to war. Everything I just said is false. Now, everything I said is what they believe. It's what they would tell you. But what I'm telling you is that everything they believe is false, and I'm basing that on first-hand information from the head of the CIA and the president's national security advisor and the president. Um, so what did General McMaster say? He said acceptance and containment are unacceptable. 
In other words, the United States will not accept a nuclear-armed North Korea. And be clear about what he's saying. We're not saying if they hit us, we'll hit them. He's saying they're not going to be allowed to have these weapons. So you have the following situation. Kim Jong-un is going for it. He's in what's called breakout mode. He doesn't, he's not even trying to be clandestine or surreptitious. He's just going for it. He's like in uh, American football. He's like uh, Tom Brady in the red zone going for a touchdown. He's just going for it. He's going for the weapons. He said he is. He said, I will not talk to the United States until I have this arsenal. Then I will talk to them peer to peer and nuclear power to nuclear power. He's made that very clear. And he has good reason to think that's in his best interest. The U.S. has said, you can't have them, period. And again, that's not me. That's not my analysis. That's not inference. That's what General McMaster said. That's what General Mattis said, our Secretary of Defense, a couple of days ago. That's what the President has said. The problem is people aren't listening. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. You're not going to do it. You know. They're listening to the economists. They're not listening to what the White House is saying, what they're telling you. And McMaster timestamped that this is happening before March 20th. Now, it's not going to happen in the next five days because President Trump is going to Beijing. He's going to meet with President Xi of China, and they're going to talk about this. Uh, by the way, here are my probabilities. 10% uh, probability that Kim Jong-un stands down. He wakes up and says, all right, you got me. You surround it, whatever. Um, I'm going to verifiably immediately give up my nuclear weapons and missile testing program. I'm going to invite in inspectors from the United Nations or the IAEA, uh, you know, to verify all this, and we're going to normalize relations and eventually denuclearize de the Korean Peninsula, and uh, we'll try to get North Korea back in the family nations, do some, whatever. 10% um, chance, because, for the reasons I mentioned, which is he doesn't think that's his safest path. He doesn't think that preserves his regime. He thinks he'll get a bullet in the eye like Gaddafi, probably will. And, um, uh, and again, he's made a clear win. When terrorists and dictators and bad guys tell you what they're going to do, believe it. Adolf Hitler wrote a book in 1925 called Mein Kampf. In the book, he said, I'm going to mobilize Germany, conquer Europe, and kill the Jews. Ten years later, or less, he mobilized Germany, conquered Europe, and killed the Jews. When they tell you what they're going to do, believe it. And Kim Jong-un told us what he's going to do, and he's demonstrated it by the operational tempo of his testing program. So he's going for it. So I only give that a 10 percent chance. Probably should be zero, but, you know, as an analyst, you've got to allow for that. 20 percent chance he gets assassinated, and, at this, uh, and we have regime change without a war. Regime change without a war. Uh, and this came up in, again, our meeting with my, uh, Mike Pompeo. Uh, somebody said, uh, you know, why don't you just assassinate the guy and get this over with? And, of course, it's illegal under U.S. law to assassinate anybody, especially the CIA, because they used to do this. And, you know, there's some workarounds, but, you know, they, um, that was, everyone knew that Pompeo couldn't say it. But what he said next was interesting. He was asked, why don't you just assassinate the guy? And Pompeo said, I'm not going to answer that, because... If an unfortunate accident should befall the man, he should die. I wouldn't want anyone to misunderstand my words. It was like talking to John Gotti. It was like talking to the Godfather, right? So, and I spoke to a CIA asset who confirmed that they, they were working on some assassination plans. He said his particular plan was put on the shelf because it would have killed too many other people. So, um, so that's a possibility. But this is what President Trump is going to talk to President Xi about when he meets him in Beijing. He's going to say to Xi, Will you join us? Will you, the Chinese, join us in trying to kill uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un, decapitate the regime, and have regime change in North Korea? Um, I don't know what Xi's going to say. My estimate is he's going to say no, because um, I spoke to the head of the National Security Study Institute at Tsinghua University. We had lunch a couple of weeks ago in Washington, and uh, she told me that Beijing doesn't Beijing thinks the U.S. is bluffing. Beijing buys the line that the costs are just too high. And I say, well, you go back to Beijing and tell them we're not bluffing. But, um, but we'll see. But, but he might say yes. And even if he says yes and we work together, it's still a long shot. It's not easy to do this. Um, and so uh, I only give that a 20% probability. The 70% probability is war. And uh, the other possible outcome, which is that the United States accepts North Korea as a nuclear armed power and as they cross the finish line and we don't do anything about it, I give that a 0% probability. So 70% chance of war, we start it for our own good reasons before March 30th. So write it down. Uh, what's it going to do to the price of gold? Well, you don't need me to tell you, so um, it's not a reason, well, 
probably is a reason to buy gold. No one's rooting for war. Uh, I understand how horrific it will be. General Mattis has told us how horrific it will be. The American people are being prepared for this. The world is being warned. It's too bad no one's listening, but you know, again, I can, uh, I can assure you this is uh, underway. So, uh, so what's the end game? Um, we talked about digital threats. We talked about cyber threats. We talked about the axis of gold. Um, the end game is uh, getting rid of the U.S. dollar as a benchmark global reserve currency. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, dollar did not replace sterling overnight. It took 30 years. Uh, it's not going to take 30 years this time. It's been underway for a while, by the way. You could probably go back to 1971. But uh, the IMF has a world money. They call it the special drawing right or the SDR. Uh, usually you mention SDRs to people. They think it's, you know, strawberry daiquiri on the rocks. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a special drawing right. By the way, the, the elites, they intentionally come up with geeky names so that nobody will understand it. Like, oh, man, you just put me to sleep with these SDRs. Um, they do that on purpose. Uh, why is the central bank in the United States called the Federal Reserve? Because it's a really boring name. Americans hate central banks. We had two central banks. We had a central bank in the late 18th century, and we got rid of it in, uh, I think, 1816. And then we had another central bank beginning in 1820, and we got rid of that in 1835. From 1835 to 1913, the United States did not have a central bank. One of the greatest periods of growth, prosperity, innovation, invention, price stability in the history of the world, no central bank. Works just fine. Uh, and Americans hate central banks. So when the Rockefeller interests and the Morgan interests and, and uh, the Schiff interests and others wanted to plan a central bank in 1912, 1913. They said, well, don't call it the central bank, because Americans don't like that. Call it the Federal Reserve. And you know, Americans think it's some kind of you know, bonded whiskey or something. They don't know. But uh, so same thing with the, with the SDR. But, by the way, the IMF is the central bank of the world. They just call it the International Monetary Fund. And the SDR is world money. They just call it SDRs. So that's what you're dealing with. But the SDR thing is. Uh, it's small, but you know, some kind of gold-backed SDR, some kind of crypto digital SDR, distributed ledger technology. By the way, the BRICS, uh, they are our friends, the BRICS, right there. Uh, this guy's under criminal investigation. This guy's under criminal investigation. <laughs> dictator, dictator, and a guy who made your money illegal. But there's your BRICS. Um, but they, uh, but if you, uh, they have 14.8% uh, approximately of the voting power of the IMF. It takes 15% to veto something. You know, when you want to do something big at the IMF, you need a supermajority, you need an 85% vote, meaning that anybody who has more than 15% can stop it. Guess, name the only country in the world that has a 16% vote in the IMF. Anyone? Guess? United States, right? What a surprise. So the, so the United States has veto power. But if you combine the BRICS, plus Venezuela, and Venezuela is now a client state of China. Venezuela is you know, complete, in complete chaos, social, monetary, political, and otherwise. So it's a client state of China. So if you do BRICS plus Venezuela, they have more than 15% today. So if you had another global financial crisis, the kind we saw in 2008, the central banks, you say, why can't they do the same thing again? Well, the answer is they never normalized, right? So the Federal Reserve, I showed you, went from 800 billion to 4 trillion. They're still at 4 trillion. Now, they're trying to normalize, but they just started last month. So if you had another crisis tomorrow, what are they going to do? Go to 8 trillion, 12 trillion? I mean, where's, where's the invisible confidence boundary where people say, I'm out of here. Get me out of here. Give me some gold, silver, art, whatever. Well, they know it's there. You can't define it, but theoretically, you know it's there. So they're trying to get their balance sheet down, but they've just started. If you had the crisis tomorrow and you couldn't, and the central, it's going to be bigger than the central banks, the central banks are not going to be able to bail it out. That's going to come from SDRs. That's where the global liquidity is going to come from. But the BRICS plus Venezuela are going to say, oh, you want to print 3 trillion SDRs? It's about uh, $4.5 trillion, trillion, not billion. Uh, well, you need our votes. And we gotta, we'll do it, but we've got a couple conditions here. And one of them is you've got to get rid of the dollar as the global reserve currency, as the benchmark global reserve currency. No more dollars for now on SDRs. The dollar won't go away. I'm not saying the dollar goes away. It just becomes a local currency, like the Mexican peso. So, uh, uh, and this is what China wants. Everybody's like, oh, China wants a gold back yuan. No, no they don't. The, the yuan's not ready to be a global reserve currency, but the SDR is. So, um, so, here, so what do I do? How do I sleep at night? Well, here's my model portfolio. It's 10% gold and silver, physical, not uh, futures, not ETFs. 
don't let anybody tell you, you know, Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I've never predicted the end of the world. I have predicted global financial crises. That's easy to see. Uh, life will go on, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but to me, 10% is a good insurance policy. If 10% goes up 10 times, that insures 100% of everything else you have. So if you've got stocks and bonds and things like gold insurance, 30% cash, people are surprised. Now you can have in treasury bills, very, very liquid uh, uh, bills. People say, Jim, um, I'm surprised to hear you say you have cash. Aren't you the guy who wrote a book called The Death of Money? Um, well, the answer is I might not want cash forever. I might not want it for long, but I like it for now because uh, two things. Number one, it's a deflation hedge. Remember, gold's your inflation hedge. It's also a deflation hedge, but cash is a deflation hedge. Also, cash has huge embedded optionality, meaning if everything's collapsing around you, you're the person, you know, if you're selling assets to get some cash, you're in distress. But if you're the person with cash, you can go out and buy things on the cheap. Condos, shares, companies, whatever it might be. So that option, that at-the-money call option on every asset class in the world, that's part of the value of cash that's usually not fully appreciated. Um, I like bonds, you know, you know treasury notes. Uh, again, this is your deflation hedge. If deflation gets the upper hand, which it might, uh, the real these interest rates are going to go much lower, uh, and you'll have huge capital gains on the bonds. Uh, I like real estate. That can be farmland. It can be rent paying, uh, et cetera. Um, I have stocks, but it's private equity, alternatives, tech, uh, venture capital, uh, macro funds. And then, yeah, there's room for public equities. I, I like natural resources and gold mining. Um, you know, season to taste. If you want 5% gold, well, you're better off than 99% of the people in the world. If you like, say, I want 40% public equities because stock markets are rock and rolling, be my guest. That, that's up to you. You're all smart people. You know how to do this yourself. But um, I don't know how people, people say, yeah, hey, gold, it seems weird to me. You know, how do you sleep at night? I'm like, how do you sleep at night without gold? That's my question to them. How do you sleep at night without some gold? And uh, I, I do recommend that. Um, Wrote a couple of books on the subject. Uh, I it's not like a book salesman, but everything I've discussed here is in these books. Um, Currency Wars says a lot more about the war game. Uh, New Case for Gold goes through some, uh, some of the slides I showed you in a lot more depth. Uh, death of Money uh, shows you the instability in the system today. And The Road to Ruin is more forward-looking, tells you when, when the financial crisis actually happens, what you should expect. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, thank you very much. Thank you.